Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at Penn State University with Professor Randall McIntyre, who is the PI on the WRXR rocket mission, which means he's the principal investigator. So he's managing the rocket mission, which is going to have the Sugar One payload on board. So tell us more about the WRXR rocket. The Water Recovery X-ray rocket is an X-ray spectrograph um, designed to observe the Vela supernova remnant. And so sounding rockets enable us to fly payloads into space for low cost, and that allows us to do good science return for minimal budget on a time frame that is consistent with, say, a graduate student's um, course of study, which also allows us to train future um, instrumentalists and scientists in our field. And why use an X-ray rocket? And so in astronomy, um, different astronomical objects emit radiation in different wavelengths. And so humans can see optical light with our eyes, but we can't see x-rays or ultraviolet light or infrared. And so if we want to study astronomical objects at those wavelengths, we have to use different instrumentation. And so x-rays, if they're emitted by an astronomical object, cannot penetrate our atmosphere. They get absorbed in the upper layers. And so we have to get above that atmosphere to observe those sources in the x-rays. Oh, right. So you're going above the atmosphere so you can get a better picture, basically, of this supernova. Right. Atmosphere. Or any picture at all, just simply because the x-rays don't make it down to the ground. And mm. so if I built an x-ray telescope on the ground, I could never observe these phenomena. Mm. And so anything in astronomy that has very high temperatures, that's very energetic, extremely dense and hot, they will emit a lot of x-rays, and so to study those extreme environments, the extreme of physics around those environments, we want to be able to fly an x-ray spectrograph, and that x-ray spectrograph can then look at that object, and in this case for the works rocket, as we call it, we're looking at Vela supernova remnant, and so this is a massive star that exploded. And so How long ago? <laughs> so this, <laughs> this particular one is somewhere around 10,000 years wow. ago, but that's one of the that's one of the characteristics that we want to discover and and you do that by taking a look at the x-ray spectrum and so this massive star this star was probably 20 30 times the size of our own sun um, lived out its life and at the end of it exploded into a supernova and as that blast wave propagated out into the galaxy it swept up a lot of material it heated it up to very high temperatures and then started emitting x-rays and so by looking at those x-rays, we get an idea of, in each of these explosions, how much matter is returned into the galaxy, how much energy is returned into the galaxy. And we find when we look at a galaxy that these objects, these supernovae, and their remnants kind of dominate the dynamics within a galaxy, how things move around, how things get fed back into the galaxy, which is an important process. If we take a look at our own solar system, the planets are made out of material that isn't hydrogen and helium. And so if you take a look at right after the Big Bang, what we expect the entire universe to be made out of, hydrogen and helium. But at the cores of massive stars, those get fused into heavier and heavier elements, mm -hmm. like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. And then those stars explode and those elements go off into the galaxy, can form other subsequent systems, say our own sun, yeah. And then as that system is formed, then the planets around it, and then us here today asking these questions yeah. <laughs> out of the, that same star stuff. So why are you wanting to go and look at this particular supernova? And so the Vela supernova remnant is very large on the sky. It covers 8 degrees roughly in a circle. And so it's very, very big. That's 16 mm -hmm. times the size of the full moon. Mm -hmm. So it's a, wow. it's a massive expanse on the sky. And because of that, we haven't fully characterized the bits of the remnant. So what processes are going on to cause it to be this hot environment emitting x-rays. And so we've looked at bits and pieces of it with other x-ray observatories that orbit around the Earth, such as the Chandra X-ray Observatory and XNM Newton. However, having suborbital rockets, the ability to go up into space for a little bit of time to see a large field of view is something that these um, observatories can't do. So our large field of view diffuse spectrometer can take a look at a large chunk of the Vela supernova remnant, characterize this x-ray emission, and see what's going on with the temperature, the density, 
the age of the plasma and get more characteristics on what's going on in this particular supernova remnant. Mm -hmm. How is the science that you're going to find from this mission kind of applicable to us and how we evolved? Right, and so when you take a look at a supernova, um, supernovae are bred from these massive stars. Massive stars that explode after they've lived out their life, which means that they've fused elements in their core all the way up to iron on the periodic table of the elements. Mm -hmm. When they explode, the rest of the elements get made during that explosion. So all the elements of the periodic table are created within this star. Mm -hmm. Then it explodes and distributes those elements back into the galaxy where they can go back into other interstellar medium that collapses to form another solar system such as our own. Mm -hmm. And you have the star at the center, the planets around being formed out of the metals and rocks that we're used to, and potential for life to then be formed around that star. And so it all starts, that whole process starts with generation of those elements within the star, and then how are those distributed back into the galaxy. So that's kind of the question we're taking a look at what is that matter and energy feedback? How efficient is it? Um, and you know, get that for several different supernova remnants, so we have a better census of what's going on in the galaxy. Yeah. So, what's your job here at Penn State University? So, I'm a professor of astronomy and astrophysics, and physics as well. And my my job basically is broken down to a few facets. One of which um, is teaching, and so I teach uh, astronomical courses. Currently, I'm teaching an undergraduate astronomy course, Astro 1, so just the very basics of astronomy. Um, but the classes I teach vary greatly. For instance, next semester, I'll be teaching a, a graduate course on radiative processes. And so it changes depending on you know, the, the year, and, but that's good. It keeps, it keeps things yeah. fresh. Um, in addition to teaching, I do a lot of research, and that takes up a lot of my time. And that research is broken up into two main avenues. One avenue is taking a look at technology development for future NASA missions. And this technology, mission, this technology development um, really concentrates on building efficient X-ray grading spectrographs. And at the heart of those spectrographs lay X-ray gratings. And so I do nanofabrication to create our own X-ray gratings here at Penn State. And so that takes a lot of time, but it's also a lot of fun and We're that's the WRXR mission comes into that part of your research. Right. We get to then utilize those gratings that we create from scratch and put them on um, a suborbital rocket. So that's our other half of our research activities, in addition to that technology development, is then, as you said, put that technology onto a payload and actually place it into space. And so these are all technology steps towards hopefully using these gratings one day and these spectrographs one day on a larger mission yeah. that can then do more science for a longer period of time. Excellent. And tell us about the launch, because it's, it's going from the Kwajalein Atoll of the Marshall Islands in the Pacific, that's right, which is very, right. very far away, right. <laughs> in the middle of the Pacific. <laughs> and traditional launch sites um, are typically in the Northern Hemisphere mm -hmm. um, at latitudes that do not allow us to observe the southern sky. And so the northern hemisphere, we see a different sky than the southern hemisphere does, mm -hmm. which means that we miss out on roughly half of astronomical yeah. targets. And so this particular target, the Velo Supernova Remnant, is a southern target. It has a low declination, which means that it's in the southern sky. Right. And so to properly access that, we have to go to a southern launch range. And the most um, viable launch range for that is the Kwajalein Atoll. How did you get into this profession? So when I originally went to my undergraduate institution, I did a pre-med biology undergraduate study, course of study. And during, after my third year of that, I realized my heart really wasn't in it, but during that time, I took an elective in physics, and I really enjoyed physics a lot. Um, and so I started studying physics instead, and during that course of study, I took an astronomy course, and I decided I really liked astronomy a lot. And so um, I switched full over to physics and astronomy, um, did an undergraduate degree in that, and then went on to do my graduate coursework in astrophysics at University of Colorado in Boulder. And that's where I met my advisor, Webster Cash, who um, was also an X-ray instrumentalist. Right. And during my course of study with Webster, um, we had done a lot of different X-ray instrumentation studies, but then we decided that we'd like to go and try to fly a suborbital rocket. And so for my thesis payload, I was able to I'll propose for a thesis rocket that I found interesting, and this was observing the Cygnus Loop supernova remnant with a diffuse X-ray spectrograph. 
and I got to design that and build wow. it and put it all together, launch it, analyze wow. the and data. That was all for your PhD thesis. That was all for my That's PhD awesome. thesis. And so it actually took quite a long time. I was seven and a half years doing that just mm -hmm. for my PhD. Um, but I think that um, that goes to show you, or at least is an example for some students out there to say it's okay to be dedicated to your graduate coursework, yeah. even if it takes a it long takes time. A time yeah. Um, if it's doing something you love and it's quality work and then that will show up in the long run. Yeah. When I got a job as a professor, I started applying for grants to allow me to do more x-ray rockets. And so the first one um, that we did was uh, a similar uh, payload to what I flew for my graduate thesis. Um, we observed the Cygnus Loop supernova remnant again. Mm -hmm. And then based off of that payload, we did some upgrades, and that became the design for the water recovery X-ray rocket. Mm -hmm. And then built off of those um, successes, we're now designing another rocket called the Off-Plane Grading Rocket Experiment, or OGRE. Oh. And that one is a, a high-resolution spectrograph, and instead of looking at a large, diffuse X-ray object, it's just looking at a point source. And that's a current project, right? That's, that's right. launching soon, right? That one will launch in 2021. All oh, right. And so we're, we're developing that payload right now. The optics and the gratings are being fabricated, and then we'll put those together and test them over the course of the next couple of years leading up to launch. And that's an exciting payload because that will create the highest resolution spectrograph or spectrum of an of a X-ray object um, to date. And so that's very exciting. So I'm just trying to get my head around some of the lingo. And so what do you mean when you say a point source spectrograph and a diffuse spectrograph? Okay, so first of all, a spectrograph is a device that takes light and turns it into a spectrum. Right. And so, for instance, you might have seen sunlight pass through a prism creating a rainbow, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we build similar devices which take X-ray photons, pass them off of a surface, and create what we like to call the X-ray rainbow. Right. And once you distribute the light in such a way, you're able to see the constituent wavelengths that make up that spectrum, which tell you the physics of what's going on in the object. Now for a diffuse object, a diffuse object is something that's resolvable in the sky, something that you can tell that there might be a clump here or a clump there or there might be several stars. It's something that you can tell that there's structure. Okay. And when you can see the structure, that means that it's diffuse okay. and that means that it covers a large range or field of view on the sky. Okay. And so for that particular spectrograph, you have to have a collecting optic that can see that chunk of sky and then take that light and create the x-ray rainbow. For and That's typically very hard to do. It's, it's hard to capture that entire field of view and then confine it into a spectrum that's easy to read on. Mm -hmm. When it comes to a point source, a point source is an unresolved point in the sky. In other words, a star. A star is a point source. Mm -hmm. It's so far away that we can't see the star. We can't see the structure of the star itself. We just know that there's a point of light there. Well, thank you, Randy, for having us here and for hosting while we integrate the Sugar One payload into the rocket. I'm going to go and speak to some of your other colleagues now to learn about other aspects of the rocket. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.